Hi, I'm Catherine Porter from WadLogic. I'm an independent energy consultant. And in today's video, I'm going to speak to you about marginal pricing. Now, we often hear on the news that Britain sets its electricity prices based on the price of gas. And there's an implication that this is in some way weird and unusual, and that we shouldn't use the most expensive form of generation to set our power prices. Now, in fact, every deregulated energy market in the world is using marginal pricing to set its electricity prices. So Britain is neither unusual nor weird to do it this way. So in this video, I'm going to explain what marginal pricing is, how it works, and why changing that wouldn't really make that much difference to our bills. So marginal pricing is used to set the electricity price immediately before delivery. We close our wholesale market one hour before delivery and the market is what we call self-dispatching. There's no central authority that decides this stuff. Power stations choose whether it's profitable for them to run based on the market prices at the time. Wind and solar have almost no marginal cost of running. So if it's windy and sunny, they will run. Nuclear is also very cheap to run. Then hydro, then biomass, and finally gas. And the marginal unit uh, that's used will be the most expensive one and uh, which one that is will just depend on how much demand there is. And then the efficiency of that unit is what sets the price. Now, because this is all happening very close to delivery, you're also in that window where the National Energy System operator, NISO, starts to what we call redispatch the market to account of, take account of the physical requirements of the grid. So this means things like grid constraints and managing voltage and current across the network. And so sometimes that means that NISO will turn off power stations in one region and turn up power stations in a different region in order to manage that balance. So we're already breaking the link then between what's actually dispatched in the market and the marginal power plant. And some of the costs of that are reflected through what we call the balancing mechanism, and that's recovered through the network portion of our bills. Now, in fact, the most liquid part of the power market is the day before delivery. Different markets have different liquidity uh, focus. Um, in power, it's the day before. In gold, it's on the day, really, although the entire forward curve is pretty liquid for gold. For base metals, it's the three-month contract because that reflects the expected time to get metal out of the warehouse and deliver it to where you need it. So liquidity can be concentrated on different parts of the curve. And in the electricity market, it tends to be the day before delivery. Now, what you might wonder why that's interesting, and that is, and the reason for that is uh, how our bills are calculated. Because when Ofgem is setting the uh, electricity wholesale component in the price cap, it actually uses the forward contracts for the price cap period. So if we're looking at Q3, which is um, starting in uh, July, then July, August and September, uh, then the observation window for that is from February to April. So every day between February and April, uh, Ofgem looks at the market prices for the July, August and September forward and futures contracts for electricity. And then it takes a weighted average of those in order to calculate the price cap. So if you can imagine this at the day ahead, it's already quite difficult to understand which will be your marginal plant uh, that's needed to meet demand. It's very much more difficult to do that uh, up to five months ahead, um, and which is effectively what the price cap methodology requires. And that far out, you're really looking at statistical models, some expectations of weather, but it's all very much on average and in aggregate. Now, the next question is what happens or what would happen if we changed the basis for our price formation and moved away from using gas as the marginal form of generation? And to understand the impact of that, we need to really understand how all of these different types of generation get paid. Because if you think about wind and solar, its short run marginal cost of operation is close to zero. But that doesn't mean that they can manage without having any income. Um, clearly, these things cost a lot of money to build, and if they were receiving no income, then they would never be built. And so because they don't really receive very much income, if they were just to sell their electricity at the short run marginal cost, they receive subsidies. And these subsidies are 
applied directly to bills. They bypass the wholesale market altogether. And so um, if you look at this chart, you can see that most of, or I will tell you that most of the gas generation does not have any form of a subsidy. Most of the nuclear doesn't have any form of a subsidy. Uh, the hydro tends not to have much of a subsidy. The solar and the wind have lots of subsidies and the biomass has lots of subsidies. So that really distorts the picture because it's not just the wholesale price you have to worry about for your bills. It's also the level of subsidy. Now, this chart explains that in a little bit more detail. Um, we, can, we have uh, different types of sub subsidies. So for renewable generation, there are basically three subsidy categories. You've got the renewables obligation, the feed-in tariff and the contracts for difference. Now, you, we also have something called a capacity market, which is designed to provide backup for wind and solar. And some forms of renewables uh, are also eligible to receive capacity market contracts. So um, if we look at how this breaks out across the market, 23% of our electricity generation has a renewables obligation with or without a capacity contract. 6% has a feed-in tariff with or without a capacity contract. 15% has a contract for difference with or without a capacity market contract. 13% has just a capacity market contract. And 5% has a cap and floor mechanism. This is primarily directed at interconnectors um, that uh, new interconnectors being built receive uh, a guaranteed return uh, known as the cap and floor mechanism. And only about 40% of the market is operating on a fully merchant basis. Now, all of these subsidies really, with the exception of the feed-in tariff, have some linkage with wholesale prices. The strongest linkage is with the contracts for difference, where there's a direct connection between the wholesale price and the CFD. Now, this is the new uh, subsidy for renewables, so all new large-scale renewables that receive a subsidy, receive a, capacity, uh, receive a contract for difference. Both the feed-in tariff and the renewables obligations are closed to new projects. So with the contracts for difference, um, you have a market reference price, which is linked to the wholesale price of electricity, and you have a strike price. And if the strike price is higher than the wholesale price of electricity, then the customers, everybody, this comes off our bills, we have to pay those generators the difference. And if the market price is higher than the strike, the generators pay that back and that comes as a discount to bills. Now, unfortunately, the only time that we've ever received any money back under the contract for difference was during the gas crisis when electricity prices were exceptionally high. The most recent subsidy round, which took place last year, set a strike price for offshore wind at £83 per megawatt hour. And that compares with the average wholesale electricity price based on gas for 2024 of just £73 per megawatt hour. So the uh, strike price for offshore wind last year was £10 per megawatt hour higher, or the, and that's 13% higher than the market price based on gas. Um, so... The renewables obligation also has a link with gas, but it's more of an indirect link with gas, um, and it's similar with the capacity market. And essentially here, um, the generators that have a renewables obligation or a capacity contract, they expect to receive two main income streams. One is through their subsidy, the renewables obligation or the capacity contracts, and the other is through the wholesale price. And it's very likely that if the wholesale component of their income was reduced, they would require that to be compensated through the capacity market um, and also through the renewables obligation mechanism. Um, and so because they're really looking at the total income that they wish to receive. Uh, and so any reduction in the wholesale price would almost certainly be replaced like for like. Uh, through the capacity market and through the way that the renewables obligation certificate prices are determined. Now, the other problem we have is if we reduce the wholesale income available, that will also affect the 40% of the market that's currently fully merchant and not receiving any subsidies. We have a significant risk to electricity capacity as we move through this decade, with potentially a third of our gas generating fleet uh, retiring by 2030 as a result of old age um, and it simply wouldn't be economic 
to carry out major uh, repairs and maintenance on these aging assets. Now, if they start to earn less money, then there's a large chance that their retirements will be brought forward. And unfortunately, we simply cannot afford to lose 10 gigawatts of capacity out of the market. We had a near miss blackout event in January of this year, which was quite a shock and led to the renewal of the biomass subsidies, which are very controversial. And so it's likely that if the um, wholesale market price fell and wholesale revenues fell, a lot of the gas fleet that currently operates on a fully merchant basis would need to receive a capacity market contract in order to stay open. And so really, it would be uh, stealing from Peter to pay Paul. Uh, wholesale prices may well fall and their, their share of the overall bill would fall, but the subsidy elements would all go up to offset that. And the net effect to consumers would be nothing. There would be no meaningful reduction in our bills. And in fact, the bills might go up because uh, generators that currently don't receive any subsidy would then receive some subsidy. And unfortunately, the way the capacity market works is that it is paid as cleared, which means that all assets within the capacity market receive the same price. And so not only would you have to pay those generators that are currently in the fully merchant category some level of subsidy, uh, that would be uh, leveraged really across the whole market. And so it might very well end up being the case that you lower the wholesale price and the, end, and the overall bill goes up. So I hope you found this video interesting and please come back for more in future videos.